Post. Um, I want to pick up with you some issues that I think we brought up before in our discussions. Okay, first of all, there's this whole notion that mental disorders are basically um, a, an imbalance of serotonin, as you pointed out. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but serotonin is what makes you happy, right? So wouldn't um, having a kind of, you know, extreme degree of serotonin be very good, in fact, very desirable, and something that, in the rare cases that it does happen, we should encourage? I mean, it seems like it would be. Um, I, I don't exactly understand why this would be identified as a problem. And I don't understand what, how possibly someone living in a free society could take it upon him or herself as a responsibility to try to regulate this and say that it's bad. You know, when I was misdiagnosed as having manic depression, basically, um, it was never done by a doctor. There was a nurse who basically listened to me talk for 15 minutes in a very, very strange state, because I'd never been um, in a hospital before, so I was under a good deal of stress. And in an attempt to impress upon her everything that had happened, um, at the time I was reasoning in a very strange fashion because I was following a cult. In an attempt to impress upon her everything that had happened, um, I basically... Um, uh, she basically, rather than listening to me, told me that I was talking at 90 miles an hour and had to talk at 60 miles an hour. Uh, and uh, she said she had to bring me down to a normal level. And I found it very strange because it was really out of consideration for her and out of my education and being able to cram a lot of information into a few minutes to present a given presentation that I, I, I spoke very, very fast because I wanted her to I didn't want to take up too much of her time. Uh, so she basically gave me a diagnosis without any sort of evidence. And this was more, went, went more or less unquestioned for several months until most people realized that it had been a misdiagnosis. But by then, since I was already in treatment, nobody really wanted to um, just renege entirely on the diagnosis. They wanted to, to suppose that I had something else of some sort. But for some reason, they always presumed that whatever the cause was, it was chemical. It had nothing to do with the fact that I was following a religious cult. It had nothing to do with the fact that my ex-girlfriend's paranoid mother happened to work for the very hospital that they worked for, um, and that the relationship ended badly. Uh, no, um, they presumed upon some kind of chemical basis for my behavior, which there was never any evidence of at all. Now, uh, as for the thing about serotonin, you know, y you'd imagine that anyone following a spiritual path has at one point or another ex had a religious experience, and this is a truly joyous experience. You'd imagine that there would be a lot of serotonergic relief during these experiences, especially since, if you think about it, it's not that different from a drug experience, and a lot of the recreational drugs affect the same kind of change. It's this, this erratic spike in serotonergic relief. But arguably the reason why spiritual practice is better than religious practice, and I have followed spiritual, or sorry, uh, better than uh, using drugs, and I have followed spiritual practice for a while, is that it's natural. It, um, the release is, it has a clear um, underlying uh, cause that's, that's, total, that, that's more or less spontaneous, but it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a realization of basically you know, your oneness with everything around you, which is the aim of a lot of spiritual practice. Well, now, it, it, the parallel between madness in the Western sense and spirituality and drugs has been drawn time and time again. You can see this in Aldous Huxley or in Alan Watts or in the work of J.D. Salinger. Um, in fact, uh, J.D. Salinger is one writer whom, if you haven't read him a, in good deal, um, I would strongly recommend that you do, because he definitely depicts the kind of angst that a lot of Westerners feel when they try to practice Eastern forms of yoga in the West, in a culture where they're the kind of behavior which is totally normal in, say, Hindu society, is looked down upon as unusual or eccentric or even sick by people who don't, just don't have that kind of cultural frame of reference. Now, my main problem is this whole notion, though, 
that the presupposition is that the origin of this kind of serotonergic relief that that, that, that that the brain is the cause of the spiritual condition rather than the spiritual condition being the cause of the brain activity. This seems to kind of go back to the whole materialist notion that we have in science that basically all consciousness is a result of brain activity, but this seems completely counterintuitive. Um, this is just basically something that was established by Descartes as a f philosophical frame of reference. And y you may know that you know, since you're studying this kind of stuff, that most of Descartes' theory was originally developed based upon an encounter that he supposedly had with an angel. Now, you might say, well, this this is a hallucination. But, I mean, so it is with a, a good deal of um, Jungian theory. Jung had a series of supposed encounters with entities of some sort, and he said that all the the, the massive volumes of theory that he developed afterwards into psychology was really secondary to that original insight. So no matter how you look at it, uh, the, the origins of any kind of way of thinking that we have are rooted somehow in some sort of mysticism or spirituality. Um, but, the, but there's another component to it, and that's like, uh, that for some reason, people working within the materialist model you know, t totally rejecting the notion of any kind of spiritual motive for something, or, or you know, or the, or a kind of radical distinction between uh, between material happiness and spiritual happiness. You know, the kind of thing that, which is a day-to-day -day experience for a lot of people. Uh, they reject the work of psychologists uh, like Jung and Eric Fromm and. Sigmund Freud as, as, as being somehow outdated or, or, as you put it, disproven. And this is the second point that I want to contest to. Because uh, these are things which there have been so much overwhelming anecdotal evidence for, so much, uh, so much positive regard and gratitude for the contributions of these people who've given us actual maps of human motivation, not based just on science, but based on the arts, based upon what we know from poetry and the humanities and all these things, uh, that uh, it's impossible to disprove them, in a sense. It's like saying, oh, well, I'm going to disprove God. Well, you can't disprove God based upon the absence of personal experience, Bec because personal experience could prove something that could be called God to an individual. But in the absence of that, you're not entitled philosophically to rule out the possibility. The fact that you can consider a possibility means it's a possibility. And, and being reductionistic about it isn't going to help because there's so many people who've had religious experiences that it just seems totally silly um, to take the negative approach. It's like always denying the existence of something I, the burden of proof is so much greater upon anyone as opposed to affirming the existence of something. But this is all common sense, as you know. Um, so, and, and very important. So, there's that whole aspect to it. So, you know, Jung's work has been so influential and so important and so helpful to so many people. It seems like there's no real way of disproving it. The only way to possibly falsify it is to continue it and to somehow revise the theory of the archetypes. But now, on this issue of the theory of the archetypes, you know, when I believe myself to have bipolar disorder, I was always trying to figure out, well, what exact activity is it that I'm doing that's so strange? People impressed upon me that, you know, my behavior was unusual, but I mean, I had no way of knowing, well, what, which behavior in fact was unusual. I mean, I'm certainly not in the neurotic habit of behaving merely in an imitative way, um, or in a fake way, in order to impress upon people that I'm normal. That's exactly uh, contrary to, I think, the aims not only of psycho psychoanalysis, but of human life in general. So I was really intent on trying to figure out, well, what exact behavior that comes out of me spontaneously could possibly be tarnished? And what I found, looking back on it, looking up back at it from a Jungian perspective, which is something which has helped me in many aspects of my life, is that I was really trying to figure out, well, which of the archetypes, which of the central human 
um, driving mechanisms which Jung found and which appear in culture after culture was really um, was really the problem. Well, is it the reasoning intellect? Is it um, the capacity for you know lateral thinking? Is it uh, is it one of the more emotional impulses? Is it uh, 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 is it the inventive impulse? What is it exactly? You know, is it Mercury? Is it Hephaestus, so to speak? Um, well, the truth of the matter is. This kind of reasoning is no different from the kind of religious reasoning I had at the time, which is that of uh, the fallacy of the higher self. Um, the notion that you know there are some aspects of our psyche which should be repressed and others which need to be um, encouraged. But you see that this notion goes back to our religious tradition in the West, a very, a very outdated religious tradition. But but essentially, the the, the way that I was treated by the mental health staff was really no different at all from the way that people were treated in puritanical society. It's this whole notion that there are certain aspects of the psyche which, rather than let, uh, being allowed expression and being allowed to more or less attain some kind of uneasy peace between themselves, should be repressed entirely by a patriarchal ego and, and, and should, should not be given any kind of expression and should be kept in check. But, you know, it's very strange then in our scientific frame of reference, somehow people don't draw this parallel between, you know, the kind of puritanism that you see reading Hawthorne's literature and the kind of puritanism that you see in the psychiatric community. There, there's this whole notion that m man's nature essentially can't be trusted. And then there's the, the whole myth that there's a genetic basis for these, for these more or less invented um, categories of labeling people. Um, now, genetics, from time and time again, has been proven to be fairly overrated. It, 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 I mean, genes code for proteins, and whatever predisposition they may create, it's been shown time and time again by scientists that really environment will really be the determining factor in what genetic predispositions will be allowed expression. In fact, uh, even some genetic predispositions change over the course of one's lifetime. So, uh, when you, especially if you study the history of psychiatric illness, what you find is that the, the word mental um, illness or mental disorder, well, mental disorder goes back to mental illness, but the expression mental illness is supposed to be just used to describe any kind of illness that we can't find a physical um, cause for. And the whole enterprise of psychoanalysis was supposed to be to, fi to provide us with a pantheon of possible psych psychological causes for something. It might be the religious instinct. It might be just an, an existential crisis, an attempt to reconcile with things. You know, um, these were people who in the West actually began to acknowledge that the materialist view was insufficient. Um, and so they studied things like Hinduism, where it, in their very sophisticated model of the human organism, they counted not just for a physical body, but, but, but for a spiritual body. I mean, you might say, you know, Western science has been very complex and uh, successful, but it's always done so in a one-sided way. And I think the reason I'm so distrustful of anyone claiming science as it's practiced in the West to be an absolute authority is because, yeah, it's an ab it, it can be of help to people who um, who are, are treated well by the medical establishment, but it's not of help to people who are mistreated by the medical establishment. And um, where the interference in one's individual life is really gets fascistic. And I can speak about this from personal experience. Um, the Buddhists and the Hindus all understood that there's this distinction between a kind of chemical happiness and uh, and a kind of profound spiritual joy. And if you study Western literature, you see that this is, a, this is a universal trend, this notion of needing to find meaning in one's life and needing to understand different mysterious, vague impulses um, which come through and manifest in poetry and in the arts and in dance and all of these things. So, I mean, I've come to the conclusion not only that I was misdiagnosed with having manic depression, but that really there's no such thing. I mean, any kind of act behavior 
which you might say is typical of manic depressive behavior. First of all, you could say that of anything, um, pretty much, um, if you d disagree with it. And, and secondly, you, you, could, you could show that its fundamental cause is one of a number of archetypes, or one of a number of wills, whichever psychoanalytic theory you subscribe yourself to. And I think that this whole notion that we have in the psychiatric community of, you know, claiming that the, the lifelong work of a Freud or a Jung was disproven is just a, a way of, of overlooking the facts, of overlooking the facts that, uh, that we're being one-sided here and only tending to the material body and not attending to the spiritual body, presuming that any kind of... Um, any kind of mental activity has its origin in the brain, and that the origin isn't outside of the brain, acting upon the brain. And I think that if there's any cause for depression, it's this worldview, in fact, because you're basically, because, I mean, if you really want to reduce yourself to just an organ, a mechanism, not an organism, but a mechanism which responds to things like pain and pleasure entirely, you're going to have difficulty making decisions in your life which involve invoking a will to meaning or something of that nature. So, I mean, just drawing upon my, edu my education in psychology and my knowledge of literature and things like that, I find it surprising, really, that anyone would even buy into this. Especially since, you know, you can read about stuff in a book, but, you know, a scholar always knows that what, what he or she is being taught contradicts something else, somewhere else that he or she read. And uh, you really have to, to be very careful about what you buy into and, and uh, go by not just your own personal experience, but other people's anecdotal evidence as well. So that was just my bone to pick with you. If you have any intelligent answers to give me, please reply in any form convenient.